Вы не желаете? Не желаете? Ну ладно. Спасибо за сердечное приглашение на эту прекрасную, прекрасную организацию. Моя задача and Brussels is somewhere in between. So Belgium is not only Brussels, it's more than that. What about colorectal cancer? Um, I think not only in Belgium, but all over Europe, colorectal cancer is a problem. In most of the countries, it's the third most common cancer for male and female, and it represents 13% of the diagnosis that were made on cancer throughout Europe. So to start the, the, the talk and to give you an idea about the situation in Belgium and implementing the um, European guidance on colorectal cancer, some years ago we started with a screening program and just focusing on the complexity of, of the country, you clearly see that you have two different ways of um, having screening in Belgium. You have the Flemish screening program and you have the French speaking. So it's a matter of language how the screening is implemented in a small country. We started in 2014. It's a population-based strategy. That means everybody between a certain age can have the test uh, performed. It's an IFOP test and the age category is between 56 and 74 years. The reason that we don't start at 50 is because there is not enough budget to start at the age of 50. So also in a country like Belgium, which has a very good economic system, still there is some constraints on the budget. The test is performed every two years, and the test is sent by mail, and the person performs the test and afterwards it's sent to a central lab to give the result of the testing. So this is an overview how it's performed. So the age category between 56 and 74 years is an IFOP test sent by mail. You get the IFOP uh, analysis performed in one central lab. It's for free, so it's the government who support uh, the whole uh, organization. You get the result within 14 days per mail, and if the IFOP is positive, then afterwards a colonoscopy is planned. Like I said, it's performed every two years, so that means we started uh, two years ago, the whole cohort is now screened, and we are restarting uh, next year with the first uh, cohort that was tested. So what is currently the participation rate? Because if you look to the guidance in Europe, you need a participation rate for most of the screening programs of 60%. For colorectal cancer, in most of the countries, you never get the 60%. You have here 49%, which is relative high if you compare it, for example, with the Netherlands, a country just uh, beside us, and you clearly see that there is a difference between the age categories. Here you have 50%, here you have 45%. So the older the population, the less people are performing the testing. Based on the cutoff value that we are currently using, there was 10% positivity. That means the whole population that was screened performed the IFOP, the 48%, and from that 48%, 10% of the testing was positive, and these patients were then referred for screening colonoscopy. The turnaround, and that's also an important point, needs to be very low. That means you get the test, you perform the test, you get the results, and afterwards you are um, referred for colonoscopy, and normally, 
it has to be less than 16 days based on the European guidance. For the moment, we are 18 days, and it's depending on the impact of um, the uh, colonoscopies that has to be performed, whether you will go to uh, 12, 14 days. So there is some waiting time between having a positive test and performing of the colonoscopy. What are the problems? Uh, first of all, I think we have to go to a system where screening starts at the age of 50, because if you look to the frequency and the incidence of colorectal cancer in most of the countries, it's starting between 40 and 50 and not at 56. Second, one of the problems that we are still facing, there is no quality control on the colonoscopy that is performed. The IFOP, you have seen 75 is the cutoff value. Is this the good cutoff value? And there is also the fact that you have one central lab. You need a very good quality control of the central lab to have the exact value and to refer the uh, healthy person with a positive test for colonoscopy. What about accreditation? Um, in some of the European countries, there is accreditation for colonoscopy. Some of the accreditation system uses the level of 1,000 colonoscopies. Um, it's also important to have a good colonoscopy performed, and the role of sedation is important. So also there, there is still some work in progress. Let's move now to the clinical setting, where you have the diagnosis of uh, colorectal cancer. This is a classical case, 54 years old, received an IFOP test um, um, outside the uh, program, colonoscopy was performed, a diagnosis was made, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma of the colon, further staging was performed, non-metastatic adenocarcinoma of the left colon, and the final staging was a, a G2, T3, no lymph nodes involved, and no metastasis. So the question is now, how to manage these people? Do we have guidelines to tell us how to guide our decision whether this patient needs adjuvant therapy, yes or no? There is one central um, organ that is currently making the guidelines for colorectal cancer, not only for colorectal cancer, but for every tumor type. And this is, for example, an update of 2014 where we focused on colon cancer, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. And for example here, stage two, adjuvant chemotherapy can be considered for stage two colon cancer, taking into account the presence of high-risk features in the tumor, comorbidities, and patient preference. So there is something where oncologists, but also surgeons can build on their decision uh, for guidance uh, to treat these patients. Stage three, there is clear, adjuvant therapy is necessary, and oxaliplatin-based therapy is the um, um, combination that we use in most of the patient. There is also, and this is becoming much more important with the introduction of immune therapy, and especially in the metastatic setting, there is also the status that um, MSI testing needs to be performed in um, guiding whether you can use 5-FU in this setting, yes or no. Also some remarks on the elderly population. Um, elderly patient based on age alone is not a criterion to select whether you go for adjuvant therapy, yes or no. It's more the indication based on stage two or stage three uh, cancer type. Going from the adjuvant setting, towards uh, the metastatic setting, and this is the further follow-up of this patient. At a certain moment, you have an ele elevation of the CA level. At that moment, workup was performed, and a big liver metastasis was detected in the right uh, liver lobe. One of the important steps that we made over the years was the multidisciplinary team discussion. And in every country, I think everybody is convinced that it's important, but if you look to the practical work up and to the discussion that is held, it's not always in a way that quality is assured for the patient. 
In most of the centers in Belgium, you have uh, different practitioners around the patient. You have the general practitioner, which is playing a role from a social uh, standpoint and also knowing very well the patient for comorbidity. You have the oncologist, the surgeon, the, radi uh, the radiologist, the radiation oncologist, and other specialists that are involved, especially also the pathologist, which is becoming much more important than before. At a certain moment in 2003, um, we had the feeling that we need to do more to guarantee the quality of the treatment, not only for colorectal cancer, for the majority of uh, tumors that we are treating. And there is a law uh, voted in 2003 that clearly uh, gives the centers some idea how to organize their oncology and how to guarantee the quality for their patients. One of these parts of this law is clearly stating that a patient needs to be discussed at a multidisciplinary um, team meeting. And one of the things that we did um, last year is an evaluation after 10 years of multidisciplinary uh, discussions that were performed. And what you see here is that the percentage of patients discussed at the multidisciplinary team meeting is almost um, 90%. Not only in Brussels, but all over the Belgium um, country. What you see is that there's still some difference depending on the tumor type. For example, if you look to breast cancer, the majority of patients are discussed at the multidisciplinary team meeting. If you look, for example, to melanoma, which is the green line, still there is a gap between breast cancer and melanoma. Hopefully, with the new options that we can have for these patients, this will change in the future. So you clearly see that there is still some difference depending on the tumor type that is treated. What was also important, and that makes the system um, working very well, there was reimbursement. So when we discuss a patient at a multidisciplinary team meeting, the team gets reimbursement from the government. The government said, we pay you, but then you need to fill in a very good registration. And this formed the base for our cancer register. And that's the reason why we have a very strong quality, uh, high quality level cancer register available, where you have data available. For example, these are data for 2013, but the new data are recently uh, published on 2014. And so you can see the incidence but also we have data on prevalence and also data on outcome of these patients of the different tumor types. For example, colorectal cancer, we have um, 6,221 new cases and 2,490 patients died due to colorectal cancer in 2013. We have also information on the stage. 50% of the population has stage four or stage three. And so based on that, we try to have quality control over our patients based on the multidisciplinary uh, team discussion. Other things that made quality of our patient care very high is the National Cancer Plan, where the uh, government put a lot of money on screening, but also on um, innovation and also on patient care. And that's the reason why it's not only turning around the oncologist when the patient is going towards the uh, consultation, then go to the medical treatment or the radiation treatment. Also, you have a whole team of other people, supportive people, that are taking care all along the trajectory that the patient is uh, going along with the diagnosis of colorectal cancer and also the other uh, tumor types. That means that the team is not only the team of the physicians, but you have psychologists, social workers, volunteers, nurses, uh, nurse navigators, and dietitians available for the patient. And the only thing that we want to do is to increase the quality of care of our patients, not only based on the support, but also on the data management that we have available. And for example, one of the key players to follow our patients 
is the onco nurse navigator. That means a nurse that is dedicated not to give chemotherapy, but to give advice at the moment that there are side effects when consultation need to be planned. And you clearly see over the years the number of contacts that the patient have with these nurse navigators is increasing dramatically. The same is true for the psychological support. These are the different tumor types or the different tumor clusters. And over the years, although in the beginning nobody was convinced from the physician side that psychologists are important, you clearly see that the number of contacts are increasing over the years. Data management, not only at the level of the country, but also in the uh, centers, we have the possibility to do something with the data that we are generating based on patient care. And this is the number of studies that we are performing on this data over the years. And also here, you clearly see that the number of studies are uh, going up with an important focus on translational research. And this is one of, I think, the most important things that we did in Belgium is to try to have an integrated biobank system. And all the big institutions have a tumor bank, which is financed by the federal government. For example, here we have our tumor bank. And you clearly see that the number of samples is increasing dramatically. And this is also linked to the informed consent that patients need to give to get this sample. If a patient is entering the hospital, in the brochure it's clearly indicated if there is rest material, then the hospital can take this material to do translational research. So there is not a necessity to have a written informed consent. The same is true for serum, tissue, and also for whole blood uh, samples. These are the different regions. For example, if you look here to the digestive system, we have more than 12, 000, uh, 1,200 samples available of the different tumor types in the GI uh, system. What about treatment? If you look to the drugs that we have available in Belgium, these are all the possible drugs that are on the market, and all are reimbursed with the exception of the newer one, TAS-102, and pebrolizumab. That means if a patient has colorectal cancer and the government decides to reimburse, every patient can have the treatment without uh, having private insurance. So it's paid by the government. This is an important point, and this is a system that needs re Let's try a matter of uh, microphone. One, two, yeah. So what we have seen also with the uh, RAS testing, um, most of the institutions performed key RAS. Nowadays, RAS is the standard of care for testing our patients with colorectal cancer. And um, we discussed this morning the use of NGS. Probably we will have a centralized system of NGS performed in the big centers and the samples are sent to these big centers. And that is the algorithm that we have available in our patient population to be treated. So if you have a RAS mutant patient, you have all these options available with the exception of Ramusirmap in second line. RAS wild type, you have the different options available uh, currently, again, with the exception of Ramisirumab. So in that case, if a patient is having um, colorectal cancer with metastasis, these are the different options that we have available. So in conclusion, what we did over time, it's important to have sufficient data 
input of data on safety, not only on safety, but also on quality indicators to guarantee for our patient the quality of care. You need a structure. That means you need guidance of your quality and try to maintain the quality. And it's also important to, that you have communication, not only inside the hospital, but also at the national level. And the only thing that we want to do is continuously improve the quality of care of our patients. So by this, I want to end this talk, and I wish to thank the whole team in Antwerp Hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Peters. A very uh, and, uh, important presentation. Very interesting data for us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On us прениях в дискуссии выступает профессор Рашида Вахидовна Орлова и профессор Стрейковский. Но мы предоставим слово даме сначала, я думаю, а потом уже Даниил Львович выступит. Сидя или как? Сидя, да, здесь? Нет, у меня слайдов нет. Спасибо, Марк, большое за презентацию. На самом деле это очень интересно, что вы нам рассказали. Indeed, that's quite interesting. Thank you for presentation. There are some things that, uh, with respect to treatment and diagnosis, we we have similar things in our institution. What concerns screening, however, uh, we have no such screening uh, in, in, in our vicinity as it is performed in your country and in Europe. Uh, mainly this, 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 these are patients that come uh, self, then uh, generally our screening is, so to say, uh, arbitrarily screening this for selected cohorts of patients. For us, 50 years, that is too late since screening, that means big money. It should be performed as a state program. If we shall survive till this screening, for us, 50 years, that is too early. I think that according to international recommendations, we shall uh, implement them, imply them, something later, at later age. Uh, so that is a uh, to the specialists, which uh, when they, uh, when they t tell us about their screening programs since we do not have do not have an integrative integrated program for screening of colorectal cancer uh, our, poor, our poor surgeons do not practically see early forms of colorectal cancer only late forms I would, I would, that is a good method with respect to screening AMZ. It is cheap. It is easy and it is so, it, it is so to say, a bedside method. Uh, and best based on this, and then there is on these results, a colonoscopy, of course, may be formed. Colonoscopy, in a way, needs uh, good equipment, good specialists. It requires it requires uh, for example, I have posed the question at one of sessions how close we are to this to 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 to, to the process of screening in order to perform it. Uh, what shall we do then? If we shall have these patients, uh, are we ready to uh, admit them in proper way according to the to world wide guidelines uh, so independently of what we have uh, and we are not ready to these measures uh, we are able to do it at least in some regions of Russia and address our state for this sake, I have not heard uh, what what happens with those patients who have genetic predisposition for 
colorectal cancer. Are they screened or not? Um, genetic predisposition is a separate group. They are going to the genetic center mm -hmm. and they are, uh, first of all, there is a family tree genetically tested and when they are having a mutation, they are uh, having a very close follow-up in a separate program. What I showed is the global population. Mm -hmm. So we get the global population with the exception of the genetic ones and the ones with the family history. Thank you. Uh, what concerns? What concerns treatment, proper treatment? There's those guidelines that uh, have shown by you. We fulfill all these principles. We decide questions on uh, for the full fox and adjuvant uh, therapy and so on. The only. Uh, only difference is uh, only that some patients uh, pay themselves or they are paid by private insurance companies, not only on the count of own state. And we are generally, we in this respect, we are going parallel with, uh, with other countries, uh, Western countries. I have worked uh, in, in 20, for 20 years in a federal institution, and thereafter, uh, we in, in at medical at medical uh, institutions, a minimum of three specialists are discussing, up to five specialists are discussing a single patient, and taking decision about his his further treatment. That is pathomorphologist, of course, and radiologist is also switched to, and medical genetics. Uh, without this, without this council, uh, no, no one patient is admitted to the hospital to this aim. In federal institution, any any such institution has its own weight uh, at it is to, uh, so it, it, they, they take their own decisions and that uh, and the patients are treated according to uh, internal rules of these federal institutions what concerns statistics to my mind uh, uh, we may tell and we may uh, print but but this cancer register is lame. Uh, even those uh, famous St. Petersburg cancer, there is no such director as neuroendocrine tumor, gastrostromal tumor. And then if this, this the patients with colorectal uh, cancer, uh, they will mask some other types of cancer in, the, under this, in these instances. And maybe that is normal, the patients come to different institutions and they are not so strictly following the filling these forms. Uh, hence we, since with Belgium, in Belgium there is, a, in, in comparison with us, an, an excellent system of registration. And by a bank that is made in small country, it is possible. In Russia, this is uh, this is things must the thing that is must to be, and today we have performed a session on melanoma, and uh, for example, we speak about some interesting case, and a molecular genetic study would be uh, additional studies would be useful. In the case of biobank, it would be it would be very very important. Uh, so biobank, it, it is a, an important issue. What concerns treatment, uh, irrespective of early, intermediate to late forms, we are on good level here. Thank you. Daniel Lvovich, I would like to, 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 to thank Mark Peters for such an example, very good example of work in this respect, um, Bilge is about 
something in the population of Belgium, Belgium is about and similar to Moscow. Moscow maybe is not not much poor, not much poorer than Belgium, but when most organization the design arrangement of appropriate medical uh, problems in Moscow is uh, is something worse than in Belgium. Uh, this uh, we are practicing doctors. We cannot influence our authorities in some cases. First of all, uh, with respect to arrangement of uh, uh, health care, uh, unfortunately, so this uh, carriage is before the horse. So the situation is quite, op quite opposite to Belgian one. I have several medical questions. What concerns patients with MSI? What per percent of patients with MSI do you have? Do you see in your routine practice? We have made an uh, chromosome for microsatellite instability. This analysis in, uh, is implemented in uh, in, uh, in Moscow, not not far from this moment, and. Uh, I think, however, that uh, the way it is known to uh, that is a target for some new drugs. Maybe we are uh, looking for this MSI the wrong way. So, second question: You tell about Karas and about B Raf. Uh, is B Raf involved in routine testing or not? Uh, since that is uh, that uh, confirms the uh, usage of uh, different drugs such as monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, but, yeah. that you are looking. If you are looking to the patients that are going to adjuvant therapy, you know, and it's the same situation. We are around 10, 15 percent of the total group of patients. If you are looking to the metastatic population. Um, currently, we are less than the 10% that are MSI high. But I must say that it's due to the drugs that we are becoming available that we are doing that testing in routine in the metastatic setting. What, uh, what это как раз и... May I give a comment? Because I, I believe we are talking about different... Uh, the, I, I believe we are talking about different things, basically. Uh, I think it's better to uh, talk in English because I'm afraid that translation will be affected. Uh, microsatellite instability occurs in two groups of patients. Very young patients who've got this uh, type of cancer because of inherited mutation and elderly patients. When you're dealing with our population, both of these, these groups are depleted. For some reasons, we have a lot of high mutation load for hereditary breast cancer, we had some powerful ancestor here in Russia, powerful Slavic guy, who brought, or woman, who, who brought uh, BRCA1 mutation. And for that reason, we, uh, if, we can, if you consider, for example, our patients with breast cancer, there is a higher probability to detect BRCA mutation as compared to Western country. But this is, uh, Total is the opposite for colorectal cancer. We don't have significant share of founders of the nation who brought hereditary breast cancer, uh, hereditary cancer gene. And if you consider Western estimates, about 3% of unselected colorectal cancer patients would represent Lynch syndrome. And in our case, this is six times less, uh, half, half of the percent, uh, 0.5. That's one thing. Another thing, uh, as you know, Western population is more aged, and also, let's say, active treatment is more frequently applied to the aging patient. It is not uncommon to see a patient who was uh, who undergone surgery in his 80s. And here that's uncommon. We have depletion of elderly patients. First of all, because of low life expectancy, and second, because it's, these patients are not going to uh, be treated actively, let's say. And for that reason, our population of patients have depletion from the both sides, from the young side because of lack of hereditary reputation, and from the 
elderly side because of lack of elderly patient. And for that reason, our estimates that uh, if you take surgically treated patient, our estimate is 1.5%. That means roughly six times less than in the West. That's the reason, I believe. I think um, you're completely true, but that's what I'm telling, that in Belgium it's around 10% because we have a different population than over here. Uh, coming to the question on BRAF, um, you know that BRAF is becoming much more important also because currently there are some ideas how to treat these patients. And based on the fact that we have um, multi-testing platforms available uh, in most of the centers, it's not a very uh, difficult task to test not only for RAS but also for BRAF. So we get that information from the molecular pathology department. They are also working for smaller hospitals to have a single test BRAF testing available, which is currently um, done in most of the institution. Um, my question still is um, BRAF is important, especially when you want to treat these patients in clinical trials, but in the current clinical practice, it's still an open question how to treat. And there are some data from um, the Italian groups that you need very aggressive treatment, but if I see sometimes patients that have three, four lines of treatment and are BRAF mutated, this is probably another proportion of the BRAF aggressive uh, group. So I think we have to be very careful to make a link between the BRAF status and the clinical practice. Большое спасибо. Замечательный доклад, замечательные примеры. Наверное, надо переходить к следующей теме. Let us go to next.